Hey, greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Plan B Success. We have a special guest today who's going to enlighten us about higher performance, driving higher performance. That's what today's topic is going to be about. And we are going to hear everything about things that he does with CEOs, things that he does with small and medium businesses in terms of taking them to that next step and things around CEO boot camps. And that's none other than Bob Norton. Bob Norton has been in this business for a pretty long time and has established himself as a leader of operational systems, production systems, high performance, driving high performance, and coaching CEOs. Having said that, why don't I invite him to talk a little bit about himself and introduce himself to us? Welcome, Bob. Well, thank you. Yes, I, I, uh, I've got 30 years now as a CEO, and so my story's pretty long, but you know, I can give you the, the short bio version, if that's what you're looking for, of sure. how I got where I am. And as you said, I do focus on increasing performance of organizations, anywhere from startup uh, level to you know, a couple hundred million dollars, and implementing proven best practices that come from management science as well as my own experience but typically aren't used very often and oftentimes even the best business school programs don't teach these uh, very practical uh, techniques so I, I started actually as a technical person uh, i was a software engineer and then systems engineer and then uh, vp of engineering and chief technical officer uh, back in the 1980s for Thompson Financial Services, which became Thompson Reuters today. And I essentially ran a skunk works doing all the product development there. I created five new products in a five year period that I was there. And we were kind of the star and, and, and acquired by Thompson uh, and generated a huge amount of value. So they left us alone. Uh, which is a good thing for big companies to do to small companies usually and, and, mm -hmm. and manage their portfolio. Uh, I founded my first company as a CEO, even though I had many entrepreneurial businesses as a child, uh, including a direct mail ham radio antenna uh, operation where a friend of mine and I made and cut antennas for ham radio operators and shipped them by direct mail advertising and classified so you know i was very entrepreneurial at a young age um, but the first company i founded as a, as an official ceo was homeview which was the world's first high definition virtual touring company for residential real estate uh, i founded that in 1989 and we grew it to over 150 million dollars in sales uh, within about 18 months after launching. Uh, IBM uh, gave us a financing deal of 34 million dollars uh, to expand it. You know, at the time I was just barely had turned 31, I think, at the time that that deal happened. Um, but I had run big product development teams and kind of cut my teeth um, doing a lot of work in innovation. But like any um, new CEO, I struggled to learn all of the disciplines of being a CEO. And so I kind of took my engineering background to that and, and framed it. And ever since, I've been gathering and systematizing all the best practices of, of starting and launching businesses and, and uh, also starting and launching products, really. So I've been CEO of, oh, I guess, about six companies now and an interim CEO or co what I call a co-pilot CEO in my CEO coaching and advisor program at, at, at nearly 200 companies now over the last 15 years in 30 or more different industries. Um, I've, I've created a couple other things to help entrepreneurs. One is the CEO and Entrepreneurship Boot Camp. Um, which I first ran in 2004 in Boston. Uh, I've run that in Africa and uh, uh, CEOs from 30 different countries um, have uh, attended that and used the, the training that's in those systems. Uh, we're running one March 21st and 22nd in Austin, Texas, the first one I've done live in many years because I've mainly provided it on, uh, on video since then. 
And the second uh, brand or invention that I have created, which helps company scale, is called Airtight Management. And airtight management is six, a framework of six drop-in systems that helps companies um, develop the infrastructure that's needed to scale. I mean, there are really two very high failure points, and the reason, you know, something over 80%, some people say as many as 90% of companies fail, is that they're, um, it, it is at the startup of not getting the product launch right and the market entry right. And then many others scale, even though they've got a great product, um, by not by by not installing the systems and infrastructure that they really need to scale. So one of the things I prepared for today's call, Rajiv, was a list of kind of the top eight mistakes mm -hmm. that uh, that companies make, and we can provide that uh, an article listing all of that uh, to to all your listeners uh, at my website as well. Awesome. So, you know, coming back to your, you know, your background, you've, you've got years of experience, you've been there, done that, and that's what you're systematizing and offering back to entrepreneurs and wannabe entrepreneurs in terms of the systems and the processes that you've created under the airtight management brand. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, what can somebody who's starting off on their entrepreneurial journey, what can they look to get from airtight in terms of uh, products and services and the guidance to get them to that next level well I, you know i provide training coaching and consulting and typically if you're changing an organization you need a little bit of all of those to make a culture a high performance culture and so I typically work kind of as an advisor to the CEO, and sometimes I train the senior management. Uh, I've studio produced 160 videos that are part of that best practices library in airtight management. And, and airtight management is really for companies that have already proven their product value or their formula. So they've got some traction already, and they're kind of getting ready to scale. Um, when you say entrepreneurial, of course, there's a big range of entrepreneurship sure. there. But if you're a startup CEO, you know, I think the best possible thing you can do is go to the CEO boot camp. That is a super intensive training with, I would estimate, between three and five times the, the content that you would get at a normal seminar per hour. Um, and it's really only for CEOs for that reason, because it's sort of a fire hose in the mouth. And in that, I, I kind of brain dump the 12 systems of starting a company, designing a business model, validating it, doing market research, doing competitive intelligence, and all the things I've learned to get 100% success rate in the products that I've launched. Because most people do that backwards. They come up with an idea, and then they kind of go away in the back room and develop the product. Mm -hmm. I do the opposite. I... I look for the pain in the marketplace and the need and I work with the potential customers to design the product and always show it to them on an iterative basis as you're building that product and so that essentially guarantees that the product is tuned for the target market and one of the the top eight failure points of startup companies is not having a, a clearly defined market entry strategy, which means defining who the best customer is and targeting them and customizing that product just to solve their biggest need or their biggest problem. And, and so a lot of companies, and you know, I, I, I'm part of the gathering of angels and you know, I've been an angel investor and done venture capital due diligence. So I've kind of been all, on all sides of the table and a lot of younger you know, CEOs and entrepreneurs think it's all about raising money. And it's, that's really backwards thinking too, because you will raise the money when you have the right business model and plan and market entry strategy. And typically you've got to allow full-time work of between three and six months to get all that stuff right. And what the mistake a lot of entrepreneurs make um, you know, another one from this list of top eight is they think putting together a pitch deck should be their first job. 
And the pitch deck is, is just kind of a view into the business. And if you haven't done the hard work of market research and competitive intelligence and pricing and working with the customers, you shouldn't be putting together a pitch deck yet. And your odds of failure are going to be really high because you're building on, on something that has no foundation, right? Mm -hmm. And so the best thing to do is to dedicate the time and the money. And, and I always tell entrepreneurs, unless you've got six months of personal expenses in the bank, don't be start, starting a business. And that's sort of minimum mm -hmm. because that three to six months is really working with customers and, and doing everything that's necessary you know, potentially even before you're starting to build the product, depending on what that product is, of course. So if you're a technical founder, as I was, you know, the, the, the reflex or the inclination is to start building the product right away. Right. And usually that's the, the wrong thing to do. I mean, you really need to, um, to work with the customers, understand their problem, their workflow and everything else. And whether it's a consumer product or a business to business product, you know, the process is all the same. It's living and breathing and working with customers and understanding their need so that you can really hammer that problem better than anyone else for them. Uh, what what uh, Jim Collins calls the hedgehog concept, right? What are you going to be the best in the world that I always recommend in my top list of books? Um, you know, the, uh, the book Good to Great, which talks about getting the right people on the bus, forming the team, and determining what your hedgehog concept was. That's kind of the core of your vision and what you're going to invest in being the best at. So you become the go-to company uh, for that problem. And it's, it's important that startups narrow that problem to a niche which is kind of counterintuitive. Everyone likes to think, oh, my, my product's for everyone. It can solve every problem in the, in the space. And that's the last thing an investor and, and someone like me that's very experienced wants to hear because that's a serious marketing problem. If you can't figure out who your niche is, who your smallest mm -hmm. person is, your biggest risk today is marketing and sales, even more than product development sometimes. And so you've really got to have identified who you're going after, what their problem is, and, and validate that business model and that product interacting with the market iteratively as you build it. Sure. And I think, you know, back to your point, a lot of startups are more about the concept stage, about creating that pitch deck. Um, not really spending as much time and energy on their market research before they even get started. You know, I think the germ of an idea is there to start something, but actually to mature that germ of an idea is what's missing. Yeah, and it's a mistake to think you can hire someone to do that for you, especially cheap and overseas. And that's kind of number three in this list I'm looking at over here of the, mm -hmm. the top mistakes you know, the, the, the entrepreneur themselves has to deeply understand the market, the problem, the customer, and how they're matching the technology or whatever their solution is mm -hmm. to that. You can't outsource figuring out what the core of your business is. Right. Um, I help guide people in that doing strategic planning processes, which is system one of airtight management. But the, the entrepreneur, or at least the entrepreneurial team, really needs to bring, uh, you know, the understanding of that marketplace to the table, uh, as well as an understanding of the technology to solve it and the solution. So there's a, there's a tool I teach, which is proprietary, called the skill set matrix, which is a way to identify that you have a complete team and to also prove that each individual in the hiring process is the right person to hire and move forward with because as a startup you can end up betting your company on a single hire sometimes and so you got to be very careful with those decisions absolutely so one of the things that i see um, on your website you know airtight systems is you talk about proven out of the box systems that can be customized based on you know the business that you're working with can you Talk a little bit about that and give us an example or two. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's six systems 
that I've assembled in a framework, and of course, there's always more than one way to skin a cat, as they say, the old expression, but the reality is that those six systems wind up being a very comprehensive solution to all problems in a, in a business. And we've already been talking about one of those systems, really, because even a startup needs that, and that's your strategic planning process. Um, so having a process to make sure you're doing enough market research and validation and good design of the business model. You know, most people think of a business model or a vision as kind of a flash of insight, but there are actually 11 different elements that make up a vision that the CEO is responsible for communicating to the team and building the organization to deliver. And so that strategic planning process is figuring out those 11 elements, obviously coming up with a budget to, to build the product and to market and sell the product and, and get the first revenues where you might be losing money and need outside capital. Uh, and then, of course, to uh, switch over to more of an operations mode. Typically, the CEO's responsibility starts at product development and st strategic planning. It then moves on to sales and marketing, and it then moves on to operations. So the more mature the company is getting, <clears throat> the further the CEO is moving up that list of things that gets done. And so airtight management, you know, you know, helps get the right process for strategic planning. The second module of, of airtight management is, is what I've named um, perform PAMS, short for Performance, Accountability, and Merit System. And that's a collection of the proven best practices in management science that unfortunately aren't taught in many MBA programs, but are learned through experience and experiential learning. And the, the most, the loudest or biggest single example of that is what most people call OKR today, mm -hmm. which really is just, you know, OKR stands for uh, Objectives and Key Results, and it was made famous by Intel and Google and others that use it. But essentially, it's a new name of an old system that was invented by Peter Drucker, the father of management back in the 1960s, um, called MBO, and then that stands for Management by Objective. Mm -hmm. And the Management by Objective process is critical to get right. In fact, research that was done independently shows that organizations that do this goal setting process well create on average 56% more value creation in the organizations than organizations that don't. And so just that one best practice is, is, you know, is sometimes the difference between surviving and becoming a market leader. I mean, if you take 56% compound value creation and do that every year, you know, think about the old, you know, Ben Franklin saying that, you know, compounding interest at only 5% will make you rich, right? When mm -hmm. you can compound it at 56%, it's really the difference between being the leader in your marketplace and going out of business. So that's mm -hmm. just one of many best practices. I teach five styles of management and when to use each one mm -hmm. um, with each individual. Uh, I teach a lot about how you have to operate differently at different sizes and scales. Sometimes the right answer to a question um, it is very different for a startup versus a company that's, let's say, running at five or $10 million in revenue today. Mm -hmm. So you got to be very sensitive to the risk appetite and the profile and how long things take. Um, I've got many diagrams and analogies of, you know, how a company grows and when you really need to shift gears. Uh, and then the third system of airtight management is, is really metrics that's dashboards and making sure you have framed what you're trying to accomplish with the processes and the inputs and outputs that are necessary. And those are financial, their quality, their activities, and their productivity. And so I designed a dashboard. I just finished one for a, a client this morning. And, you know, what a good dashboard and metrics does is it frames a department and it makes a manager of that department much better 
because it creates lots of clarity around accountability and deliverables. And it also creates benchmarks to improve against and focus. Another famous Peter Drucker saying is you can't improve what you don't measure. And, and mm -hmm. that's sort of taken literally. So those are the first three systems of airtight management. And I generally allow, you know, six weeks to eight weeks to train a management team and incorporate that in the way they operate and, and to keep it permanent because, you know, you're anytime you're changing habits, you got to continually push people or they'll sort of fall back into their older reflexes. So it's important that you spread that implementation out over at least 30 and ideally 60 days so that people are, are constantly kind of being steered towards the change that it is a better practice than what they may have been used to in their past, you know, because everyone that's hired into an organization is immediately going to start doing what they've done in other past companies and, and high performance teams have certain characteristics. And if the CEO and entrepreneur can enable and inject those things into their culture, their chances of success are, are going to be amplified by a factor of two or three. And how much, uh, you know, even in your own angel investing days, how much value or how much uh, probability of success would you put on the team that's bringing the, the company together? Oh, I, I think like real estate is all about location, location, location. Most investors will agree that, you know, success is all about team, team, team. And, and that's the biggest thing because a good team will, for, will fix a bad product. A good team will change a bad target market. The team can change anything. So it's absolutely the number one thing to make sure you're getting right. And half of that team is the CEO and making sure they've got the been there, done that experience, making sure they're coachable and that they're open to hiring the right people to complement themselves too. So yeah, it's, it's all about team. And I think, you know, 90% of investors would probably answer a question that way. They're betting on the team. You can always change the business plan or the pricing or anything out about the business. And if you're listening to your marketplace and getting that feedback and incorporating that feedback, you know, if you have to pivot the company or change the target market or change your pricing, you know, good team is going to understand and do that. And so it's much more important than anything else. So let's, let's talk about a few examples, right? So, and I don't know how aware you are of, of these, but I just wanted to, from my own experience, talk about a couple of examples. One of them is Zenefits. You know, Zenefits was in the, you know, the whole uh, automation of uh, selling benefits kind of a company. And it was started by somebody who uh, did not really have a whole whole lot of a background in terms of successes on the business side of things, it was more of a maverick in terms of uh, how he showed up on different stages. And and I think what, what became really- Not an uncommon model, the same is true of Uber and Oracle and many yeah, other yeah. successful startups, yep. You're right. So, and then, you know, eventually was displaced by, um, you know, the investors at a point in time when the company did not really perform as it was supposed to, because they had a very aggressive goal of uh, doing several millions of dollars at a point in time. And they were going against the grain in terms of competing with uh, brokers. And now the company has totally turned around and it's actually supporting brokers and becoming their technology of choice. And then you have somebody else like WeWork, you know, the recent IPO debacle that we saw. And this was a guy, again, who never had any background in business or was not even successful. Yeah, it was obvious that that was coming. And, you know, you had the, you know, many, many of those situations and, and the fraud that was happening in Silicon Valley. Right. That they did the documentary on the, the woman that started the, the company that was doing a blood test and you right. know, was really outsourcing all the blood tests to the old way and faking it all along the way, which, of course, right. is another, another so, scenario. But, yeah, you Absolutely. It, it, and I think you'll find, I don't know of an example where this is not true, although some might argue Bill Gates is an example of it. You'll always find some gray hair behind those successful entrepreneurs. They're open to coaching and they're getting the advice and they're putting gray hair and experience on their team behind them. Mm 
Right. And they may have been smart enough and lucky enough to be the right place at the right time. And, you know, they, they may have been able to be successful to a certain point, but no one's going to scale up to a large company without bringing in experienced management team people that have, you know, that know that because management and leadership and all of this stuff is art. It's not stuff you learn out of a book right. and can go through a checklist and do it. It requires many years of experience. If you're familiar with Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, another mm -hmm. book I recommend every entrepreneur read, it takes five years to become an expert at one thing. That one thing, you know, and, and CEOs need to be expert at like 20 things, right? Mm -hmm. So it takes a long time to fill up your portfolio of skill sets and you have to complement your own skills with a team that's going to do those things that, that you don't do well if you're the CEO and, and the entrepreneur. And in the eighties, you know, entrepreneurial management, you know, and a lot of leaders had, you know, what, what sometimes called the, you know, the Teflon or bulletproof vest, and they're always putting out the image. They know everything and they make all the decisions and they don't have any flaws. In the 90s and 2000s, it became much better known to have a collaborative management style where a CEO would be much more open about their own vulnerability and what they know and what they don't know and can weight the team decision collaboratively based on knowing the best person to make that particular decision. So a good CEO is never going to do what they think is the best thing all the time. They're going to take the input of the people that are most expert in that thing and weight their decision higher than their own in the collaborative management style and process. And so I dare you to dig into any of these, you know, theoretical overnight successes of entrepreneurs that are in their 20s. You know, if you peel the covers back, you'll see, you know, just like Sergey Brin at Google, you know, had loads of gray hair behind them as they scale. And the quicker you scale, the more you have to bring in uh, experienced talent. Um, someone told me I was interviewing some directors. Uh, oh, I think it was in December. And someone told me that they estimated and they had been involved in something like 200 venture capital or angel deals. And they estimated that 90% of the founders would be pushed aside or potentially outright fired along the way at some point when outside investors came in. And so that's a huge risk. Mm -hmm. And the only way that entrepreneur is going to survive and stay with that company generally is to be very coachable, to, to do what they do best, but to be willing to bring in others that do those things they can't do better. And usually scale, once a business is scaling, you know, you need that gray hair or, or like you, lack of hair. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you're right. Um, so, so Bob, a uh, couple of questions about, uh, you know, listeners looking to get in touch with you or learn more about what uh, you're out to do in terms of the boot camp as well as uh, your products and services that you offer. Can you talk a little bit about where they can find you? Sure. Yeah. Complete information about the CEO bootcamp, which, you know, I would bang on a table and say is the best thing you could do if you want to be a successful entrepreneur. That's the best two days you'll ever spend because um, you're going to get 12 systems to do all of this prior to company launching over a hundred tools and um, close to a thousand. I estimate best practices. I've never counted them all, but there's hundreds of slides and content and the complete information on that is available at www.ceobootcampatx.com. ATX is short for Austin, Texas. Um, it's, and essentially that has that event that's happening in March. Uh, and I'll probably do it again, but I haven't done it in many years. I'm doing it to just videotape it again. And because someone sponsored me and, and encouraged me to, reopen it, although it hasn't been done in, uh, in many years, but very complete um, system for anyone that wants to become a startup CEO or anyone that's in their first five years of being a CEO. 
in terms of airtight management, I have two websites for that. One is called airtightgrowth.com, and that explains the six systems, and they can all be dropped in one at a time. You know, a, a company that's ready to scale that, you know, already has some revenues. Typically, they may have 10, 12, 15 employees already. That's when you start thinking about airtight management. Although even the startup needs the strategic planning process. And so I actually, I sell that separately as a kit on amazon.com as well. The airtight management strategic planning kit, which is just the one system with all the tools uh, for the strategic planning process. Um, but that requires creativity and experience and a team too. I often facilitate those and I help add creativity and, and my technology perspective um, to, to make a strategic plan better. <clears throat> but the reality is it's what you asked earlier. It's all about team, right? You've got to mm -hmm. have someone that knows sales and marketing. You've got to have someone that knows the technology. You've got to have a business person. Uh, and, you and you might need a separate operations person in terms of customer service and delivery. Obviously, it depends on what the risks of this particular business are. But if you don't know that, then you're in trouble already. You know, you've got to know what the biggest risks are and make sure you hire the best talent you can get by attracting them with some equity and, and giving them some equity upside usually is what you do in a, in a technology company. And I like to do it in any company. Um, Absolutely. So those are the two main th main ways to, to get in touch with me. And as I said, I do CEO coaching as well. I have a program for startups that's only $1,000 a month where I have a meeting with them every week virtually, just like we're doing on, on Skype or Zoom. Mm -hmm. And I help them figure out the best answers for all the key problems of the questions that could make or break them, you know? Absolutely. So, you know, you bring about 30 years of background into what you're doing. So what does the future hold for you? And what are you looking forward to do? What would you like your legacy to be? <clears throat> well, I've done a lot of philanthropic work lately. I've been working on the reform of the divorce industry which has become nothing but a scam for lawyers and, and judges to extract money from families in their time of crisis. Um, and in all 50 states, it's an unconstitutional system that is more of a racket than a court of law. So I donate time and money to that cause. And, and tangential to that, that drove me into a business that I'm, I'm launching now. I've actually got a term sheet in hand um, for a million dollars to launch a startup of my own called Imagine Land. And Imagine Land is the first on-demand drop-off daycare system that will focus on social and emotional intelligence learning. So it's going to support people in the gig economy that don't need full-time daycare. Uh, it'll be open 17 hours a day, seven days a week. We're going to open the first uh, six to eight facilities here in Austin. And then we'll roll it out nationally, opening a um, hundred or more facilities over the next five years. So that's going to eat up the bulk of my time in, in the coming five years, I think. And it, it's meant to have a very positive social impact. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of it, but because of sole custody, which is profitable for states because of the way the federal government has set it up with incentives to separate children from parents, because of less parenting time, uh, recently a published article said that kids are only getting five hours of FaceTime with parents nowadays because we've got so many dual income working couples, right? And so they're spending all their time in institutions and they're not getting as much parenting. Uh, and also social media is having a huge negative impact on emotional and social intelligence. People think, think uh, young kids think a friend is, you know, is a star you smash on the screen, as opposed to someone who'll show up on moving day and, and take risks and help you and, and understand you and listen when you need it and all these other things. So, uh, you know, Imagine Land will try to address that for all its member families and, and, and children. It's gonna be kind of like a little Disney world with all kinds of exciting activities like our our Daedalus 7 spaceship platform simulator where the kids awesome. have to 
collaborate on a mission and the, the room will turn and smoke will come in and you see out the cockpit. Um, so this is like a little Disneyland for the kids, but I, I like to joke, shh, don't tell them it's all educational too, because they can't, they can't have fun and they can't participate without learning how to communicate and collaborate and cooperate with other kids. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, it's so great to have you on the show today, Bob. You know, we're really happy to have you on and to listen to you and get, extract wisdom from your years of experience. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll make sure that all, all the information that you shared with us is in the show notes so people know where to find you. Very good. Thank you. And, and good luck with the broadcast. I hope your, your audience grows. Uh, we need a lot more stuff getting the word out on how to be a successful entrepreneur for sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.